since no one from Zuban could be here, and I'm a friend of Zuban, so they asked me to introduce the book, which I'm delighted to do because I've always been a great fan of Zuban's. I think they're really pushing the frontiers of feminist literature in the country. And this book is a case in point, the book Elephant in the Room, which is being released today. Uh, it's part of a project, a collaboration between Zuban the, and the Goethe Institute, Max Muller Bhavan. So this is the second such project. A few years ago, Ludmila, who couldn't be here, as he said, and Larissa had come to India, and, that, and along with Priya, they'd worked with some women artists, and they'd come up with a book, and the book that resulted from that was called Drawing the Line. Some of you might have seen it. This is the second project, and this happened slightly differently. So Ludmila and Larissa came, who are both part of the women's collective called Spring, who also bring out a magazine in Germany. So they brought some other members from the Women's Collective, eight members from the Women's Collective, and eight uh, German artists and eight Indian artists together worked on this project. So Spring, every issue has, uh, has a theme, and the theme they started with was role models. But as they were working, they found that the women were coming up with stories that, you know, that are not talked about a lot, you know, stories that are usually pushed under, under the carpet and not talked about. So as the, as the workshop evolved, the book that finally emerged out of it was, uh, as, uh, as Zuban says, it takes further the argument about how deeply hidden gendered violence and especially sexual violence is. It's the elephant in the room that no one wants to see or hear or talk about. So the group worked together to see the narratives that, uh, to, to come up with the narratives that you'll see in the book. And uh, these were first published as a special issue of Spring in Germany, in German. And then they made their way to India in English for the, uh, English, for the Indian and international markets. So Zuban is really proud to have done this book and its predecessor and is grateful to the Goethe Institute and Max Muller Bhavan for supporting the project. They believe that there's some really wonderful original work being done by women artists in the domain of graphic storytelling and hope that these books are only the first of many to follow that will continue in the stream. So thank you all for being here today. We will now officially launch the book. So at the count of three ladies, one, two, three. Thank you. So I'll hand over the mic to Nandini who will moderate the panel discussion. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Anushka, for that lovely introduction. Um, I remember a few years ago, Jim Crace was here, and he said, you know, being asked to talk about writing is like being asked to cook about dancing. And in their case, I think it's even more complicated. It's like being asked to cook about singing for dance, which I don't think even MasterChef would be cruel enough to ask anyone to do, but we at Lit for Life are. So you'll have to forgive us for this arrangement because I think the art is more important than any of us. So um, we've given the art pride of place. And we'll also have to keep coordinating with uh, uh, the people at the projection booth who have been very kind to us. Um, so do forgive our, uh, what will be an interrupted session, but the art is definitely worth it. So um, let me start off. Of course, Elephant in the Room, as Anushka said, was not your first collaboration. Um, so let's talk about Drawing the Line, uh, which was, I think, your first time here. Larissa, you and Ludmila had come for the first time not knowing what to expect to India. And you had to work with a group of uh, 16 artists from India. Um, so maybe you can talk us through the process of you know, uh, collaboration of what you had to understand about the country, what your fears were, and then we'll come to how Priya had to explain things to you. Um, so, would you like to start? Yeah. Um, so, when we were invited by the Goethe Institute, Max Müller Bavan uh, of Delhi to uh, take the uh, make the workshop, the uh, the the reason was a little bit this rape case in Delhi, which which made a lot of um, uh, attention in, in the, also in the Western media. And that's why Ute Reimer Böhmer from the Goethe Institute thought that it's a good idea to invite us as 
uh, a woman collective. We are um, just women to, to lead the workshop uh, together with Priya. And we were really happy that we had Priya because we had a lot of question, questions. For example, also um, how open we could discuss with the participants about sexuality, about some a little bit difficult topics. And so um, Priya was uh, with us, so um, it was easier to, to get a feeling. And we, but we found out that it was quite, uh, the atmosphere was quite open, and we could discuss about everything really fr uh, free. And um, for sure, the reason was also that we were just among women, mm. and the participants were only women, so it was okay. like a uh, safe atmosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, or, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, my English is not so perfect. Oh, okay. Much better than our German, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I remember the first time, I think we Skyped before uh, we uh, uh, sort of planned the session out. So one of the first questions that Larissa had asked was, of course, you know, whether about how... Uh, so Larissa wanted to show examples of, uh, you know, comics that were done in Germany. And uh, so there was some nudity involved. So she, was, she wanted to know what, you know, is it okay if I show uh, a bit of uh, nudity? So I said, yeah, that should be perfectly fine. We're, you know, uh, it was a, a group of uh, so the a group of uh, women ranging from the age of uh, I think the youngest must have been about twenty, the and the uh, the eldest uh, participant would have been about in her uh, early fifties, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. So uh, and uh, the, it, these were women who were practicing uh, art. Uh, so, uh, and it was, uh, it was quite sort of easy for, I think, Larissa to, and Ludmilla to sort of, I think in the first day itself, we did a lot of these drawing exercises just to break the ice, uh, so that we would do these daily drawings. Uh, so sometimes they would be just really fun, quick comics, uh, which, uh, where we would sort of try and encourage them to tell their own stories. And they came up with some really funny, uh, humorous uh, work. And I think the humor uh, in, in the workshop really kind of, you know, helped uh, break ice. And I think after the first day, everyone was pretty comfortable with each other. And we didn't kill each other at the end of uh, <laughs> 10 days. The, re ten days. <laughs> the reason was also because uh, we, we get warned that, oh, in India, you can show naked, uh, yeah. uh, drawings so of naked. They, or yeah, they were surprised yeah. that <laughs> uh, it was all right. So just to show how serious the work at the workshop was, uh, we've got slides one to four, I think, of the, this is from the Nrityagram uh, workshop, of course, where yeah. you started off with a masterpiece. Um, there it is. Oh, those are the participants of the <laughs> workshop. Uh, this was actually yeah. towards the end, but I don't mind having it <laughs> shown. Uh, so there were eight German artists and eight Indian artists. Uh, so these are pictures from the first workshop uh, where Lud uh, Larissa, I, and Ludmilla were... Uh, we didn't really uh, make a comic for the workshop. We were uh, trying to encourage, you know, uh, the people who were attending the workshop, helping them out to uh, tell their own stories through comics. Uh, there was a lot of conversation uh, right after uh, the Delhi rape. Uh, there was a lot of conversation among very young women uh, about, and they were using words like, you know, patriarchy and misogyny for the very first time. Earlier, a lot of, uh, I think a lot of writing was on feminism was also very academic. Uh, and for the first time, I think, you know, uh, people were uh, speaking, women were, th there was that urge to kind of, you know, put their uh, stories out. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think Zuban, as a, you know, as a feminist publishing house, thought, why not use comics? Uh, what better way to kind of, you know, use, you uh, sort of tell your stories than by, you know, using images and comics? Because uh, for somebody who's, say a lay person uh, uh, who's like not, uh, who, who might not even have seen an illustrated book, mm -hmm. 
uh, it would be a great way to kind of communicate uh, uh, using comics and uh, words and images. Uh, so I think it was a great initiative by them to do something like this. I remember a few years, I think the very first Litfest, the f very first LFL that we had in Madras, uh, Urvashi was here and one of the, someone in the audience stood up and said, you say you publish only books by women, for women, so why can't you publish men, aren't you being sexist in a way? And she said, oh, ask men to write about women and maybe we'll publish them. <laughs> so, um, if you could show project, the uh, picture number five. So, I think this particular phrase is something which every Indian woman hears, grows up hearing and um, oh. so Eve tees. None of us ha has ever had any doubt about what it means. <laughs> so then Larissa and Ludmilla come here and they're like, what is Eve teasing? And uh, you know, it's actually part of the legal lexicon. I think uh, in, the, in the laws of India, you can be yeah. booked for Eve teasing, which yeah. is ridiculous. So yeah. maybe you can talk us through what it was like for you to have to explain Eve teasing, because yeah. that would have come up all the time yeah. in the workshop. So I think this was during one of the morning discussions when we were just sort of starting off uh, the day. And like I said, we would start off with doing these very quick comics drawings. So uh, somebody mentioned Eve teasing. And uh, so, you know, I think uh, Ludmilla and Larissa were wondering what this lovely word is, this Eve teasing. It's, he said, sound, so, it sounded so nice. <laughs> and, uh, and then, so basically one had to sort of explain this nice euphemism for uh, sexual harassment, <laughs> uh, which is, uh, uh, we, we realized that it's not used anywhere else in the world. It's just uh, used in India. Uh, so then we decided let's do comics where, uh, you know, th there are these instances where you have, f uh, you know, be been Eve teased. Uh, so there were, and this is just one of them, there were, I think, uh, we, we, we couldn't count the number at the end of it. So we had to tell them stop, you know, <laughs> let's now. Uh, but yeah, so this, this one is, I think, by Kaveri Gopal Krishnan, who is one of the uh, participants. And yeah, you can see the sheer stupidity of the uh, act. Uh, and this is something you can do only in comics, I think, you know, where uh, just through images you kind of, uh, uh, the emotion is very clear uh, because you see it in the image. There are very few words, but uh, uh, yeah. I, I think the humor helps also to come over it or to, yeah. to uh, mm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm to deal with it somehow when you, because all the stories got this turn to, mm. to be humorous and yeah. tragic at the same moment. Yeah. Mm. Um, so Larissa, you're not entirely German, of course. You also have a half Italian heritage. And I wanted to know when, when you came to India, because we speak often about how similar India and Italy are in terms of how, how we dramatize things and how we use gestures often. So did you find resemblances to Italy when you came? Yeah, in fact, when I, when I came to India, um, it reminded me a lot of Italy, the traffic, this, also this Eve thing, uh, thing, even if we don't call it in Italy like that, and also the, the, the role of the family and this role model between man and woman. And I was thinking, yeah, it's, it's quite half away to India, there is Italy, and um, yeah, it was it was interesting. Also, I, I I thought I learned a lot about India and how it uh, how it is as a country. But the interesting thing is also that if there is something different, you you get also um, you question also about your own uh, experiences, your own country where, where you live in, and you you find out that it's not normal. There's not this this place where everything is normal because uh, there are so many different places yeah. in the world and that's the, the important yeah, and yeah. interesting I thing in the exchange. Uh, yeah, the, I had one of the things that all the participants kept, so when they would ask us questions about, okay, uh, is it, do people in India dress like this? So then we had to say, it depends. So I think it depends, the, you know, the idea of context uh, we are very, uh, it, it's so easy for us to slip into one one role and the other and you, you're in a certain place and you know exactly how to behave or you're conditioned to behave in different ways in, you know, different mm -hmm. places where explaining that uh, kind of, you know, is uh, the nuances of that. 
uh, were uh, uh, it was interesting the, that that uh, you know it came we came up with interesting conversations around that mm. itself. So I think also for yourself it was to think about your yeah, own country so, yeah, to get asked to, so many yeah, questions. So and as the they ask, you kind of keep thinking yeah. about it yourself, and mm. you know trying to find. You might not have thought of it for a really long time, and uh, so you start questioning things, <laughs> you know, the silly aspects of your own country yourself. Mm. And uh, I, yeah. I remember one of the sentences you said the most was. Yeah, it depends, or yeah. it can be that, yeah. or also <laughs> yes, there are no, no there are no answer. easy answers yeah. in India. <laughs> right. Um, another thing which I found in common with all the all the stories which came out of the workshop was that grandmothers played a very large role, yeah. um, and so that's true. So of of three grandmothers. Uh, whose yeah. presence is here on stage? So maybe we can start with if you can project pictures seven and eight. Um, that is Larissa's Italian grandmother who inspired your first book, uh, your cook, Italian cookbook. So, do you want to talk to us about her? Yeah, uh, the truth is that I needed an excuse to spend three months in Italy <laughs> for my thesis. I had to find a theme for my thesis, and because I have this wonderful, I had uh, uh, this wonderful Italian grandmother who was a really brilliant cook. I thought it's a good idea to uh, collect her recipes and to cook with her. And in fact, it was not just that she um, uh, tr uh, gave me her recipes, but we talked also a lot about her life, her experiences, also as a woman, as a young woman. And about her marriage, she got divorced when she was 40 from my grandfather, who was also violent. And um, so, in a way, this collecting her recipes was also get this heritage of her history, uh, her, her biography. And uh, so, this, this book is not just with uh, recipes, but also stories, as well as my childhood memories. And also about her, uh, the story she, she told me about her life. Mm -hmm. uh, so then let's move on to Priya's grandmother. So if you can project uh, the folder 8, Priya. Um, I mean, because of how little time we have, we can't really allow you to read every single panel on this. But then you can buy the book, which is available, and get it signed. But maybe you can talk us through um, this very personal story of your grandmother and the images you, the image you had of her, and how it yeah. evolved and the story which came yeah. from it. Uh, so while we were at the workshop uh, at Mrityagram, so as Anushka said, the uh, we initially had a working title for this anthology, uh, and it was Role Models. Mm -hmm. So obviously, when you think of role models, you're looking at you know women in your own in your own family and uh, your own. Uh, life, uh, and then the discussions suddenly between all of us started veering towards you know uh, uh, a lot of it had to do with uh, I mean like family secrets and you know things that uh, skeletons in the cupboard and uh, you know things that are not you know kind of swept under the carpet and things that people would prefer like status quo to kind of stay as is and uh, uh, so. Uh, I started thinking about my grandmother, and interestingly, just before uh, before uh, I came for the workshop to Nritigram, uh I had the, uh, there was this uh, like a sp I wouldn't call it like a spat, but like a small argument with my cousins, my male cousins, about my grandmother. And uh, well, in my family, uh, I I never knew my grand grandfather. Uh, he he passed away uh, a long time back, but there was al always this sort of uh, you know, like this whole heroic myth about him and about what a fantastic man he was and uh, you know what a great guy. Uh, uh, so uh, he had this you know very this huge, very prominent place in the family myth mm -hmm. uh, that it was. Uh, whereas compared to that, my grandmother was a very uh, uh, she the narrative that kind of surrounded her life was that of a very stern woman and uh, I myself I think bought into that narrative because uh, she was a very quiet, very very hard working person mm -hmm. and she never, uh, I think she, uh, I think w she never showed much you know physical signs of affection or uh, she was in that sense a very reserved 
uh, person. So I kind of always thought, you know, maybe m like my granddad was the cool guy mm -hmm. uh, and she was, and everyone told me the same stories about him. Uh, until the time, you know, there, there was a point when she got this, uh, like a heart attack mm -hmm. uh, sh and she kind of started losing control of her, you know, thoughts, her mind and she started kind of telling these stories about her life and her family, uh, about their marriage. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, stories started tumbling out about, you know, how she was abused by him and, uh, and it was like a completely different person. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you sort of, I sort of realized that all this while I had been listening to the male narrative of this story. There was no female uh, version of, you know, my grandmother's story. So then, uh, and I realized that it was basically her, it was her hard work and, you know, her sort of perseverance, which uh, sort of held the family together. If she weren't, uh, she hadn't done, uh, she, uh, even my, my own mother wasn't raised by her. She'd sent, uh, uh, my grandmother lived in Kuwait and she'd sent her kids away. So I was, I'd also kind of judged her on, you know, decisions that she'd taken. Uh, so, and then at the end of it, I realized, you know, it's so easy for, I mean, the, what I wanted to explain to my cousins, my male cousins was that, you know, it's very easy for, um, it's sometimes so easy for men to uh, destroy everything yet emerge out of that story as these very tragic HBO series men, you know, slightly tragic heroes. Whereas for a, a like a woman, uh, that uh, people are not as kind, you know, in, in the posterity is never as kind to uh, someone like her who's, uh, and uh, a lot of, I, I think I, w I wasn't kind to her through a lot of her life. It, so this was like a way of uh, telling her, uh, telling a different version of her story. <laughs> And before we speak about that in greater detail, uh, if you could play uh, the PDF um, number nine, which is, uh, it, it's, a, it's about your German grandmother, Frida, and the, it, the text is in German, but then Larissa can take us through part of the story maybe, and how, because she was also a very formidable woman who, when her husband went off to war, had to protect the children, and she lived a hard life, so. Uh, if you'd like us to like to take us through her story a little bit. Yeah. So this is about my German grandmother who was born in 1903, and um, I, I when when I saw pictures from her as a young mom, woman, I was wondering how this beautiful, elegant, young uh, woman uh, turned in that grandmother that I knew as a child. She was very humorless and very strict, like this typical German uh, <laughs> character, very punctual, very, you know, nothing could be different than she knew it. And um, in a way I liked her, but she was not that, uh, that I, I, I couldn't bring together these two images I had from her. So I, I went through her, uh, her life. I, I grew up um, with a single mother, mother, so also my grandmother uh, helped a lot. So I was uh, at her, uh, every uh, every Saturday when my mother had to work and also um, a lot and uh, she was a, a ta tailor mm -hmm. um, and she were very disciplinated it's, um, she, she took a, a cold shower every morning and uh, made some exercises in front of the open window <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, there's a lot of text now. Um, yeah, and when I uh, wrote her postcards from our holidays, uh -huh. and I came back and I made some mistakes in the, the words, some, uh, so I had to rewrite write them. <laughs> <laughs> so it ended up that I never wrote her postcards from our <laughs> holidays again because it meant that I have to work <laughs> when I'm at home. So she had this. And she she collected apples in the in the gardens and mm. and brought us this um, apple uh, how do you call it apple mousse <laughs> apple mousse mousse yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know oh. it was like this this rituals that um, yeah and uh, here I because my my grandmother was born in near Dresden in East Germany mm. she she grew up there 
And uh, yeah, as a as a young woman, I saw this these photographs where she was a very elegant, and then as an older woman, she dressed just in this gray colors and ugly trousers and uh, <laughs> short hair and there was no elegancy at all just this practical aspect of things um, and uh, yeah and I, I I imagined her as a young woman when she fell in love with my grandfather and I also discovered that she um, she she had two th uh, children before she married him ah. so I was really wondering that time, it was really unusual. Yeah. And so it surprised me in some ways what, what her life was be. And as a, as a child, I found everything normal like it is. And then when I got older and I, I myself become a mother, so I saw it from another point of view. Also the things she, she went through her life, I could feel more uh, what it meant uh, for her. And yeah, she she she... Um, ex there were two two world wars, the first world war and then the second world war, um, and she had four children. And when her fourth child was born, um, they, the, na the na uh, national so uh, gave you the Mutterkreuz, the mother cross. Mm -hmm. So it was a kind of you made Germany, uh, <laughs> you made four children for Germany, and she just. Um, uh, uh, closed the door and said, oh, I don't need that stuff. And that was a little bit also her character that she was very practical and said, what is this? No, I don't, <laughs> I don't need this. And then there are really, really, really nice black and white pictures I discover, discovered from their last holiday before the World War. It ha must have been in 1932, uh, um, so it's this this holiday pictures um, where she spent with with her family at the eastern at the Baltic Sea, and um, yeah, and then in uh, 1939 uh, the Second World War uh, began, and my my grandmother was alone with her four children. The youngest one is my mother, and my grandfather was was in the war, and the eldest uh, son, he was 16, 16, and he got in the last days or last months of the war, he he was, um, how do you say, enlisted, huh? Good, enlisted, enlisted, yeah, and uh, what a tragedy to to send your 16-year-old son into the war. Uh, it's really. Hard, hard thing she she went through, and also then the the Russians came in 1945. They came to to to, to East Germany. And destroyed everything. Um, yeah, and then, but after a lot of people suffered from, uh, um, they didn't have, have enough to eat after the, the war, but she is star 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 starving, star but because they had a garden, she was working in that garden uh, uh, with with fruits and vegetables, so she she could um, nutri 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 her family? To, yeah, to feed her family, feed her family nurture with, her family. Yeah. <coughs> And then my mother always told me that when my my in the evenings when the children were in bed, uh, my grandfather read uh, Dostoevsky and uh, this, uh, these these <laughs> books, and my my grandmother she she um, so it's, uh, yeah. yeah. And after the uh, after the yeah in in fifty six uh, when all the children they 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 went to to live in west germany just my mother still stayed at home but then also my other uncle had some trouble with the uh, uh, regime in in eastern germany so they decided to to leave everything behind 56 before the uh, berlin wall was built and uh, they just had one uh, one suitcase mm -hmm. 
and they left their house, they left their friends, they left their relatives and they started a new, li new life when they were like 50, 53 years old. So um, they, they, they started a new life in, in the West and they went to South Germany where also I then was born and grew up and um, they found new friends and new, new work and uh, they became uh, grandchildren and so it's the it's the the, the life continued but mm. after going through her life I could understand more also the tragedy all the things she went through and it's a little bit this journey what life makes with a person that I could understand maybe also a little bit better that she she was she couldn't maybe not be so emotional because this would have meant that also all this bad things would have come up more that she could uh, uh, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, since, <laughs> since we spoke about you know very personal stories from the two of you and, and if you go through the books you'll see that all the stories involve a lot of digging deep into your family's history, into your own life and in fact there was one artist who had written about being raped twice, once uh, when she was on holiday and once by her own partner her, her, the, with whom she was living. So, uh, you know, as workshop facilitators, when you were sort of getting these people to look at their stories mm -hmm. so intensely, part of it is that as artists yourselves, you also need to think about the fact that once you've drawn your comics um, or your novels, your graphic memoirs, um, you know, your family is going to read them and they're going to see themselves as you see them, which might not always be pleasant. So, th so that's, that's part of it. And also when you're going back into things which were traumatic for you to live through um, or, or for the participants to live through, there's also a lot of things that can happen. So someone may have had a breakdown and as facilitators, you would have had to ensure that you were gentle and didn't push too hard. So how did that work? Oh, well, in the... Uh, we were facilitators in the first workshop. In the second uh, one that we did at Nritagram, we were just participants. So, uh, but the thing is, uh, it was a very, since we were staying together and there was a lot of sharing, you know, uh, through the day, uh, I think the, uh, it was a very safe kind of an atmosphere to be able to kind of share uh, your stories. And I think especially in the first one where there were a lot of much younger artists, uh, I think as artists and as people who read books, you're all, I think I must have mentioned this to you earlier that, you know, you're always kind of seeking validity for your own feelings, for your own life. So when you kind of hear somebody else uh, uh, tell you a story, tell you something that they went through, uh, it, it, it becomes easier for the other person to share because you kind of, you have shared experiences. So in a way, this book is also to kind of put out both these books are kind of uh, you know it's 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 uh, we're trying to put out our sh our experiences so that you know people can maybe uh, look I mean see these stories and you know find some resonance in their in their own lives with you know what what they read uh, so uh, within the workshop I think uh, the very fact that we had shared experiences. Uh, and it was not only, uh, it was what, uh, the, our experience weren't very different from the ones that, you know, on, uh, ones that women in Germany uh, actually had. Mm -hmm. Though we are like two very different countries, uh, I think uh, there was a lot more in common rather than, you know, uh, 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 differences. Uh, so, which was actually pleasantly surprising and uh, also uh, not surprising in many ways because, I mean, we read about each other's countries and so it's not like, you know, uh, they, they don't think that we uh, have snakes and elephants here uh, <laughs> anymore. And, uh, just the one in the room. Just the yeah. one in the room. <laughs> I think the differences are more maybe between the cultures or the circumstances we, we, we grew up and, and maybe also the families and the mothers we have. But as human beings, we are not different at all. And that's the, <laughs> <laughs> that's the point yeah. that um, I think also show all... Sometimes as a woman, you, um, you think you have to be always strong and show the, show the perfect things. And when you 
you hear from other people who are maybe not yeah. perfect and dare to show yeah. this vulnerability. It's always it nice to know that. You. Yeah, it's nice also to know to that nobody is well. perfect. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and it takes so long for us to realize that it's okay to be as we are. Mm -hmm. I think on that note, if we could play, um, if you could show the slide number ten and move on immediately to Larissa's uh, graphic memoir, which is 11, and it's called Bum Power. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's about one of the biggest complexes, which, uh, so, so I think this, this one is, we were talking yesterday about how in India there's so much pressure to get married and reproduce, you know. It's just get married, okay, so as soon as you're married, no one talks about sex until you're married, and then the immediate thing is, any good news, like, you know, are, are, you, having, are you having children, so you need to be having sex without condoms and reproducing, and unless you've done it in a year or two, they'll suggest medical yeah, doctors to whom you can go for help, and sometimes, um, you know, uh, I don't know, like, people who are not medically qualified but who can maybe ch bring in spirits which will somehow make you reproduce. <laughs> so, um, so this is one such which, which I really liked, uh, you know, it's about, it's about the pressure to A, get married and it, it's some, some women may not have maternal instincts but then, and people keep asking you like, no, but you, you'll regret it later or who will look after you when you're old and, and things like that in yeah. India. And Larissa said something very interesting yesterday, which if you can move on to uh, 11, Poor Power. Um, we, we spoke about how in Germany, people were just asking her to, you know, like w when she got pregnant and it wasn't, you weren't expecting it. And so when it came as a surprise and you were kind of wondering what to do, people kept telling you that you shouldn't have the baby and you know, what, what if, what will happen if, uh, what will happen to your studies and you can always have children later and you're so young and things like that. So uh, yeah, I think this one is, to quickly summarize it, it's, I mean, I think the pictures make it obvious when you're older and you look back at your teenage pictures, everyone realizes that they were beautiful, they were perfect, even in the most stringent standards. But then all you see is this, you know, you, 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 your uh, bum looks much bigger than it's supposed to be and then it is. And, and your breasts look much smaller than they're supposed to be <laughs> than they are. So. Um, so maybe we can just scroll through this. Uh, the pictures really speak for themselves. Yeah. So um, yeah, so so maybe you can talk us a little bit through this particular difference. So when when people were telling you not to have the baby, your mother was the one who encouraged you and said, "It's a lovely thing to have a child." So a lot of um, it comes through very subtly in all the stories. Maybe not so much, but not so overt as the grandmothers. But there's also this beautiful support system that mothers and daughters give each other. And maybe both of you can talk us through the fact that right from your grandmother to your mother to you and now your daughter, you've had this lineage of women supporting each other. And the same with you, Priya, from your grandmother to yeah. mother to mm. you. So, I, th I think the problem is always when other people know better. Mm how you should feel, how you should act, what you should uh, do, because I think um, I don't like... Uh, um, I, I think if you feel something, other people should encourage you to, to follow, follow this uh, instinct. And yeah, as a teenager, I was struggling a lot with my, uh, I, I, with my body. And... Um, I think I had this role model. I I, 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 I thought I have to fit in, mm -hmm. and um, but I think you no no uh, no no matter how this role model looks like, you will always find a part of yourself you you think oh, it's not it's not good like it is. And I discovered through this pregnancy that I got a new relationship with my body because when I I I had this child growing uh, in my belly so it was like I, I couldn't do anything than love this mm -hmm. body who, who created this baby so so it really helped me to get a new relationship with my body and um, yeah in fact my mother was was nearly the only one who said yeah you you no problem you will do it and I I think um, she she raised us alone as a mother so my role model uh, she she was uh, like this woman who uh, who had two children and worked and managed everything. So it encouraged me also to see that it you can have a happy life in that way also. 
And Priya, if, you'd, uh, if you could actually show slide number 18, I think, uh, which is the Bra mythology. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, this, this is just something which you can read while, while you talk us through. Yeah. Um, through your own relationship with your mother. Your, your mother grew up basically without her mother mm -hmm. around. Yeah, so. my, yeah, my mother, uh, basically my grandmother raised, she did her best to do what she could because uh, she left her husband uh, at some point, my grandfather. Uh, they separated, but the whole family didn't know that they were separated until she passed away. Mm -hmm. So this father was there somewhere, this this paternal figure was there somewhere in this these stories, but he was actually never physically present. So that's what, like, just the idea of a man in the uh, family is enough that somebody exists. He doesn't have to be present at all. Uh, but I think you, the one one truth that uh, you... Uh, the one thing that you understand at the end of uh, everything is that uh, people are complicated. I mean, even someone like her, she raised an entire family on her own and uh, she, but on her own without taking any credit for it through her whole, whole life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she would, but she had her own, uh, 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 her own biases and her own, uh, you know, uh, there were certain qualities about her. Like I remember for a birthday, one of, she used to think I'm a little too dark for a girl. Uh, I, I didn't have like this, you know, fair lily like complexion. Uh, so I remember her telling my mother, there used to be this very, there is this very famous cream called Fair and Lovely. So for a birthday she once told my, she gave, gave my mom some money and then she said, why don't you buy her some Fair and Lovely? And you know, she'll, make, like, you know, she'll probably look much better. Uh, so she, she had these various aspects to her and uh, so there was also that very strong person and there was also this person who thought, you know, that... Uh, a woman needed to look a certain way, so it's it's not just one aspect, uh, you know, in a in a in a human being. Uh, it's it's just lots of things, um, and yeah, yeah. It it's these nuances that kind of uh, make a person interesting, also. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And and this one, I really love this one because, as you can see, it's I mean, whose bra is it anyway? So Priya finds this bra in her room, but you can take us it's through it. Uh, can you guys read it? Or is it too small? Yeah. So I happened to find, I was staying in a guest house and I happened to find this really nice red lacy bra and it, it didn't belong to me. And I, uh, I was just, I, I was sort of pondering over, you know, who this might belong to. And I had this image of these various women who the bra might belong to. And it so happened that it belonged to like a, 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 a much, an elderly lady kind of came and, you know, claimed it. Uh, and uh, so this, again, it, I was, you know, I was questioning my own biases. So there is this thing of desexualizing older women uh, that, uh, yeah, that, you know, after a certain point, women don't indulge in sexual activity. Uh, so it, and so these were also actually, it, this small comics like this are also there in the book. So these came out of uh, these conversations that we had between ourselves uh, and, you know, incidents that we remembered. Uh, so yeah, so you, you kind of start questioning your own, uh, you know, deeply entrenched uh, Bias vices and uh, yeah. <laughs> um, we, they're holding up these threatening placards. So we're going to, uh, we are going to finish with one very short story by Larissa. If you can open 50. Okay. Uh, can we just show the slides then from number 15? Because um, as we talk, as we wrap up, uh, from number 15, if you could run the slides, 15, Shahrukh. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we'll open it up to questions. But this was about uh, your friend from Egypt, your roommate, and who gave you a whole different perspective on the veil, which is such a debated garment. Because in Europe, uh, there are governments like France which are banning it. And if you can just run through the whole thing, um, like you can just play the slideshow while we speak about this last thing. So, um, you know, so the liberal stance in Europe is that women should not be told what to do and then for the first time you encountered someone who was oppressed by the veil and uh, you felt that people had to come to their own decisions themselves. Yeah, I think everybody has to go through a process of finding 
uh, herself as, as a woman. And Shuruk lived with us for one year as our flatmate. She, she came to, to Germany to, for, to study. She got a scholarship and uh, she, she grew up in a very conservative Muslim family. So she was wearing the uh, wheel. But um, the first thing she did on the airport on Cairo was to, to took off her wheel and she she had this free. She she lived this free free life in uh, Germany, but still had this double uh, life on Facebook. She just showed uh, the photos with the with the hijab, and her mother didn't knew, her family didn't knew. And on one point, she decided to to uh, to to uh, stop this double identity and. Uh, to, to show everybody how she wants to live, but it was not an easy way to go through it. it took a while. You can, I, I think it's something you you really need to to experience by yourself, and it can't be a decision from one day to the next. And most of all, it can't be a decision somebody else can do for you. And yeah. Thank you so much for that. There was just so many other comics which we would have liked to show, yeah. but then we we are out of time. So if we can, if I can just see a show of hands for questions uh, for either of the artists. Yeah. So I think uh, it's number sixteen, if I'm not mistaken. No, sorry. Uh, it's no number sixteen is the pictures of the process. It's number seventeen, where numbers the folder number seventeen. If you could play those slides. Um, where you had a dog in Ritya Gram who inspired this yeah, comic. Yeah. So you can, you can see the real life inspiration were, and what yeah. followed. <laughs> there were two canine friends at Ritya Gram who uh, sort of inspired. That's Prabha Malia. She's one of the participating artists. Uh, she wrote this story, called, it's called Bitch. And uh, she's kind of broken away from the comic uh, format. These are just full page uh, illustrations that she's got. So she's kind of reclaimed the word bitch. Uh, so whenever, you know, somebody, I mean, bitch is a very commonly used word for uh, for a woman who does, you know, something that's not uh, as per norm. She's often called a bitch. So she used, uh, uh, she sort of uh, wrote this very subversive uh, piece uh, yeah. <laughs> That's one. That's yeah. a point which you were making earlier. Bitch, to you too old for that shit. Which is yeah, again, exactly. you know, yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, any questions for the for the for the artists? By the way, Priya has also been just been working on a, a, a biography of Indira Gandhi, an illustrated yeah, yeah. biography with Devi Priya. Yeah, I've Devi been Priya uh, collaborating with an author on yeah. uh, Indira Gandhi's life. Yeah. Uh, book so maybe we, we can just see the slides. So it's 14. I ha yeah, I see two questions. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Question. Uh, I have a six-year-old daughter who is showing some good interest in painting and all of that. Uh, I do not know how to take steps towards this. Uh, as a parent, how do you take baby steps and make sure that they start showing the right interest and go towards that? Can uh, you just explain I the metamorphosis of how to start and how to end up like that? I think uh, the best thing is you let her do what she wants. Uh, uh, give her a sketchbook, let her draw, uh, give, just surround her with books. Uh, it'll be nice if you're a reader yourself uh, and you sort of by example take an interest in books or uh, uh, things like that. It, I think let, don't worry too much about uh, whether she can draw well or whether she's, you know, just let her have fun. Uh, no, she has fun and yes, I that, would like great. to know, I would like to know after that what do you do after that? Let her grow up. <laughs> yeah. A question for Larissa. The, what I noted in the pictures that w were shown, um, I might be wrong, but this was my observation. You just had very sparse color. It was almost like outlines. And was it to bring out the stark kind of reality? It was almost like pencil sketches. The only color that you saw was bits of green in one dress. In the other dress, it was like you had practically no color. And even the letterings were either in green or in red. Was there a special You mean in the Frida story? Yeah. 
Why was that? Yeah. Uh, I, I think there were some colors. Maybe they were like pas pastelic, but mm. it, it was more like to create this nostalgic atmosphere. But okay. um, and in other, with the spring, we, we often use just one color or two colors. In the, but in that case, it was four color, just that, yeah, maybe it's a little bit lighter. Okay. Yeah. What was the best compliment you received from any reader of your book? And uh, was there any bad critic about your book also from anyone? Can you just talk, tell about this? Not many people have read it in India. Uh, oh, any, anywhere, anywhere yeah. for that matter. Oh, well, I can tell you, my fa I showed the story to my family because I needed permission, of course, uh, or I wanted it to be all right. And I was very surprised uh, that all the women in the family loved the book. Uh, there was one uh, person from the family who described it as a fictional piece of work. Uh, so which, uh, uh, and the person was a male member of the family. <laughs> so I think, uh, yeah, acceptance of the story was very different among. Uh, 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 <laughs> uh, so we we can the take that last. Oh, sorry, no, go I ahead, just want. Yeah. Um, I uh, remember the best compliment with the bomb power was that a man buy the original picture of this woman, of the super. I think we didn't see the picture. The last picture is that the power comes. Uh, from, from the bum. like the superwoman yeah. and uh, a man uh, bought this <laughs> <laughs> picture, so that yeah. Uh, so the, yeah, yes, please. That that's the last question. Go ahead. Yeah, my question is to Larissa, ma'am. Uh, what would you comment on the process of thinking in the form of images, like uh, converting thoughts into images? Like, how is that process like uh, can be made fine or um, like storytelling through in the form of images? Uh, before you answer, Larissa, if, if you could just play that one slide, uh, 11, uh, number 11, bump power. If you can play the last slide so that we know the superwoman image she's talking about. Uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think it's not an easy process very often. It's like that I have a story, but it's maybe not so easy to find pictures for, or the opposite, that I, I'm willing to draw something. but. Uh, so, so yeah. For example, in the story with Frida, I first wrote the text, and then I tried to to um, separate the the own, to make the, the pictures uh, from it. But it's I think um, I I don't have this concept that I make it always like that. I I try to to I struggle sometimes a lot, and then somehow at the end I <laughs> I go. Thank you so very much. <laughs> Thank you. And, and I should say that this is not even a, a sample that does justice to the wonderful artwork that you'll find in both these books. So do, do please pick them up. And thank you so much, Larissa and Priya. Yeah.